Studio Mystery Theater presents... Some men, challenge is a way of life. They can't exist without it. It can be a simple macho thing. The need to prove themselves at least better, if not best. It can be a drive to smother inadequacy or to conquer fear. Or in rare instances, it can be a duel to the death. A matter of evening up the score. This is the story of such a man and his adversary, the great white shark and of the revenge which Gunner Trent finally exacted against his enemy. It's no good saving us. What, Jimmy? The woman's unship is bad medicine. No bring up. You might be right about this one. I had read message in Sam. Then I had dream through the Kunabiti. I see written death. Death? For who? For one aboard this boat. Our mystery drama, The Great White Shark, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Tolan. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. foot twin diesel river witch, the sport fisherman's dream. This is the boat you can't buy. You have to pass judgment of the brothers who build her first. This hull is called the Fair Dinkum, and she is moored in Sydney Harbor. She is owned and operated by a bloke named Gunner Trent, who is coiling a line as a huge, powerful man in his fifties hails him from the dock. Ahoy, the fair Dinkum. Are you her, Captain? She's my boat, yes. Are you Gunner Trent? That's the label. What's yours? J.H. Burton. I'm looking for a charter. How many? Just me and the wife. What's your game? The big ones? Marlin. I don't want any sardines. I'm rated over a thousand pounds. That takes a little finding. I got the time. And the money. Three hundred a day in expenses. Money's no object to J.H. Burden, but can you guarantee me my fish? Can you land it if we fetch it? You just let me hook in and I'll bring her aboard. It may take a week or so. I got time. Within reason. We have to cruise the Great Barrier Reef. You could fly there, pick up a charter on the spot a lot earlier. Cheaper. They say you can smell the big ones with your rudder. That's Jimmy, my aborigine bloke. He's got the seven cents. He's my crew and helmsman. I don't know what I'd do without him. Now, look, Trent, you don't have to sell yourself short. I got your reputation. Now, you still want to sail with me? It's what I want. And when J.H. Burden wants something, he gets it. I'll pay you three fifty a day over expenses, and we leave tomorrow morning on the tide. Money talks, huh? All I want is your answer. Fine with me. You want to check the accommodations? I know what they are on a boat like this. Well, figure two weeks. You get me my fish on a line and have it in hunkadori. And if I don't, you better, boy. <laughs> I'm not worried. G.E. from Texas only backs winners. We'll board you by 9 a.m. The fair dinkum will be ship shape and ready to pull out. I didn't like Mr. J.H. Burden from the start. He was a blowhard and a bully. But we've been laying up for 13 days since the last charter we could use the do-re-mi. Besides, I had my own private vendetta to attend to. And maybe, just maybe a run up to the barrier might dig him up for me. They were right on 
on time the next morning. I had to drop that. Not that Jimmy and me weren't ready. We always are. What I wasn't ready for was Mr. J.H. Burden's lady. She was a breathtaker and less than half his age. I had a sudden feeling I never should have taken this charter. I could see a rough go ahead. Morning, Gunner. Morning, J.H. I'd like you to meet the ball and chain, Eve. This is Gunner Trent. I'm very glad, Mrs. Burden. Hi, Gunner. Can you possibly live up to all I've heard about you? Oh, I suppose that would depend on what you've heard. For your reputation. That for big game fish, nobody sniffs them out like you. The um, number one captain on the whole east coast of Australia. That's only because of Jimmy, my special Yamidji. Jimmy, say hello to Mr. and Mrs. Burden. Yes, boss. Uh, Jimmy, we say hello. Welcome board. You know where to stow the baggage, Jimmy? Yes, boss. Do our new friends bring us good luck? We will have empty days, but big fish run free. By and by, we cross their path, Maruka. That's a good omen. For you see, Jimmy is a clever man. How is that? Among the aborigines, there are men of high degree who are psychic. Jimmy is one of those. Before this voyage is over, I'm sure you'll recognize his value. We pulled out at noon and headed for the gap. Once we were in the open with the big swell hitting us, I had my first chance to rate my charters. Neither of them turned gap green. That means sailor stomachs. I had a feeling this was going to be a bonza show. I was on the flying bridge. My butt settled securely at the corner of the aft rail to take the weight off my bad leg. When she came topside to join me. It's a beautiful harbor, Mr. Trent. Where are we now? Heading north by west through the gap. The gap? The entrance to Sydney Harbor. Now that's north head off to the left, south head on the right. It's miles. The spread of the town around the harbor looks like the Mediterranean. Now, that'll be all the red tile roofs, I expect. I look back over the wake at the skyline. I, it looks almost like New York. So people say. You haven't ever been to New York? Oh, yes, right. In another incarnation, you might say. Now, what does that mean? Oh, I, I shouldn't have said it. Forget I did. Did I say something out of turn? No, no, I did. We'll button it up at that. Maybe I'm intruding up here. No, it's your charter. Not mine, Jay's. Matter of fact, he sent me up to ask how soon we can break out the line. Well, not till we're through the gap. Then we'll ease up off D.Y. and bait the outriggers to pick up some tuna. Well, he'll want to be in on that. Why? <laughs> Any time there's game fish. Oh, but this is not like American tuna. He's a little chap. 20, 30 pounds. We pick him up for chum is all. Chum? Oh, a bait, Mrs. Burton. I see. Look, can't we make it Eve? I mean, shipmates, after all. How would that sit with J.H.? Would you care? He pays the freight. Isn't that the truth? Well, supposing I don't care, I'd like you to call me Eve. Right. Eve it is. Oh, yes, Jimmy, what is it? Excuse me, boss. Master asked for his visit. The master's voice. Excuse me, Gunner. I've learned when he whistles, I'd better come to heel. Thanks for the travel off. Miss, no good sailing. What, Jimmy? Woman's on ship is bad medicine. No bring back. You might be right about this one, Jimmy. Jim, read message in sand. Then he dream through the Kuna Pipi. And he see written death. Death for who? One aboard this boat. What kind of death? It's not written clear, but it will be from the water, boss. Maybe the one I see. The white death is of the gods, boss. Man, come up wind against him. I sure put my foot in that shark's mouth the first time. But the next round's mine. I won't be a loser next time I meet up with him. Harry, death, if you do. One or other of us. I own a blister I hope to repay. It is not. Clear who is to die. Well, that leaves it to the flip of the coin, the way it ought to be. Even odds. But right off, before personal matters, we have to service our charter. Now, break out those outrigger lines, Jimmy. We've got to start fishing. Time was I'd have set the automatic and helped gear up with Jimmy. But since the accident, I can't move that spry. Except in the water. Funny how little difference it makes there. 
and how much it hobbles me on land. But that's beside the point. Off D.Y. we trolled and picked us up a few tuna, enough to fill the bait box. We headed north for the Great Barrier Reef, and trouble showed up. Well, Mr. Charter Captain, two days out. Where the devil are the fish? I told you if you were in a hurry to fly north and get a charter. I have the charter I want. I just want the fish. Well, I have no magic magnets. I can't draw them. We have to go where they are. Now, do you suppose there's any chance we might get there before Christmas? We'll get there. What am I supposed to do in the meantime? That's your problem. Let me tell you something, Captain Gunner Trent. We get there and you don't show me some modern. That's your problem. Jay, that's not fair. You stay out of his ease. Well, we can't expect Gunner to wave some sort of magic wand and deliver you fish for your hooks just because you're impatient. Forget it, Ace. Gunner? Eve? Yeah, it's thrown into quite a cozy little group, hasn't it? I asked Gunner to call me Eve. It's ridiculous to be any more formal. Now, I don't much care what he calls you by name. Just so he doesn't think he can call you for anything else. Jay. Oh, don't think he doesn't have eyes for you. What guy wouldn't? I just want to make sure he gets it straight. You're off limits to anyone but me. Maybe you ought to turn in, J.H. Now, what does that mean? You're pretty well shanked. Why stretch your luck? Who you explain, man? You've got a big, fat mouth. All the money in the world doesn't buy you any rights to go too far or any further. You're calling me out, boy? I'm calling you a bluff. We want to ride this charter without coming to guts her. We better make some guide rules. Don't you try to dictate any terms to me. It's my money paying for this trip. And any time I put my money down, I'm going to get value received. And don't you ever forget it. Yes, boy, I want the Sam Hill that you want. Excuse us. Ship short of you. They're looking for Master Burden. Who is it? Jimmy, don't know. Okay, I'll get it. All right with you, Captain? It's your phone call. Help yourself. I intend to. But just remember, that don't work both ways. What's yours is mine right now since I'm paying for it. But what's mine is mine all the way down the line. Come on, boy, show me where this phone call is. I'm, I'm sorry, Gunner. So am I. He doesn't care who he hurts or who he insults. He had no right to talk to you like that. My hide is thick enough. If you aren't sorry about it. You learn to live with it. She's had me on the ropes from the moment I met her. This wide-eyed girl with her steady gaze and the long, lovely legs. I could feel her calling me back into the real world. And I wanted, or I realized how much I wanted to go back to it. I went up from the stateroom to the wheel. J.H. was just hanging up the ship to shore phone. I got some business that's going to take me back down to Sydney, Gunner. You're giving up the charter? <laughs> Not on your life. This won't take me over two days. I'll fly down and back. Well, I'll put into Cairns and drop you there to pick up a flight. Where are you, son? I got a helicopter coming to pick me up and a plane chartered ready to take off the moment it drops me. Well, when will we expect you and Mrs. Burton back? Mrs. Burton? All of a sudden? <laughs> My formal. Well, Lee won't be back. Oh? Huh? Because she's not going. I'm going to leave her in your tender care. Hope I can trust you, Gunner. Six years ago, with someone like Eve, you mightn't have been able to. Since then, I have other things on my mind. I know, Gunner. <laughs> I know all about you. When I look up a man, I make sure there's nothing left to know. I wondered why you dropped out of the automobile business. Then you know I have no time for anything but to make a living while I continue my search. I do. That's just why I figure my wife is safe with you. Until I met Eve, he would have been right. Now I wasn't sure. I had a cold feeling between my shoulder blades remembering Jimmy's prophecy. That old aborigine pearl diver knew things no other man did. If he smelled death, it was coming. I could almost taste the stale odor of it in my nostrils. An ill 
assorted quartet. A beautiful and desirable woman, far too young to be the wife of the coarse man who has money enough to buy anything. A tall, lean man with a face like a mask, only his eyes revealing the pain of some buried tragedy. A wrinkled, dark brown aborigine with eyes as bright as buttons, bristling with intelligence and a knowledge beyond the normal. And the uninvited guest, death. I'll continue the story of this charter when I return with Act Two. Just slightly north of the town of Cairns, off the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, the big 52-foot cruiser, the Fair Dinkum, rides at anchor. A high moon does little to dim the bright star patterns of the southern sky. Eve Burden, a long, wispy robe over her bikini, is lying lazily across the stern cushions. Jimmy is busy splicing some lines forward and putting the fishing gear in top shape. Gunner, swinging down off the port ladder from the tuna tower, doesn't notice Eve's big handbag and suddenly stumbles helplessly. Oh, Gunner. Huh. What happened? Are you all right? Um, I'm all right. No damage. Except to my pride. Here, let me help you out. Oh, no, no. I managed by myself. Was it my bag you tripped over? I reckon it was. I'm so sorry. No need. It would take a clumsy fool like me to trip over it. You're not clumsy. That depends on whether I put my best foot forward or not. Your best foot? Well, I should say my only one. I, I don't understand you. Confession. I mean, as long as we're going to be alone together, I thought you might as well know all my worst faults. We're not exactly alone. To right. Old Jimmy there. If he wasn't, I wouldn't be here either. Some things are better not answered. Um, your ankle, do you want me to have a look at it? You'd have a hard time finding it. Why? Because it isn't there. From halfway below the knee down, there isn't any more of me on that side. Just a damn prosthesis, which does very well most of the time. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I had no idea. Why should you? I don't go around advertising my shortcomings. No more than I do. I shouldn't think you had many. You might be surprised. You know what, Eve? What? I think what you and me need is a little more company. Two isn't enough? Two, when it's you and me, is altogether too much. I'm going to kick her over and head for Cairns. You like to dance? Yes, but, but you... Now, don't worry. Just so long as I know where I'm putting my foot, everything is Bosker. Hey, Jimmy. Yes, sir. We're going to up anchor and take her into Cairns. You bring her in while I have a shower and shave. Where are we heading, Jimmy? Cairns, Missy. Well, how long... How long do we get there? Oh, by and by... Maybe one half hour. You've, uh, You've known Gunner Trent a long time? Much time. Eight, nine years. How did you meet him? In the mayor, New Hebrides. I was pearl diver. Gunner was looking for pearl? Oh, no. He comes, say, look for the big fish. But also he dives with tank and round window over his. Uh, scuba diving. Right. I find... Giant clam get careless clam close on my leg. You mean you were caught underwater by a giant clam? Yes, yeah. shell close. No, no breathing left. Then come boss. He take knife, cut, so shell open, and she will come go to surface and breathe again. He saved your life. She will drive along all same to boss. How did he lose his foot? That. He is taken by the white death. The white death? The great white shark. How? Were you trying to catch him? Not catch, Missy. Mark. Mark? You must ask boss about that. You, you must ask boss about that and other things. Jimmy, talk too much. I don't know how long it was since I'd been in right togs. 
The tie was tight across my throat. We went to the club, and she was the toast of the evening right on. And we danced. Even with the lame foot, I didn't make up too bad. It was a great evening. Later, after Jimmy had fetched us up by tender to the fair dinkum, we sat together in the stern having a brandy. Well, Gunner. Well, Eve. Where do we go from here? Nowhere. Are you afraid of him? J.H. Who else? <laughs> no. Then what is it you're afraid of? Me first. Maybe last and always. How? Hasn't Jimmy told you about me? In his own way. I don't know all of it. You want to? More than anything I can think of in my life. All right. You asked for it. I was 25 years old and golden boy. Everything I touched came up gleaming. I cornered the market here in domestically produced automobiles and was off to my first billion. But I also had some conscience. And I felt I had to plow back some of the luck I'd had. So I used to do some jobs for the CSRIO. What's the CSRIO? Oh, Lord knows. Some government alphabet soup. Commonwealth search and I don't know. All I know is my job was sharks. Sharks? Marking them, do you see? <laughs> no, I don't. They're a big problem for Australia. You can't swim on any protected beaches without a shark net. Can't go up beyond the surf without a sharp eye. So we try to control them, follow their migrations, kick the number down. We can watch them and use them commercially. But mostly, we like to mark the killers. Now, what do you mean, mark them? Go oversize with a marker and pin it to the dorsal fin. Sometimes even with a beeper if he's a real predator. You did that? Why not? Oh, wasn't it dangerous? Oh, not so much. Hammerheads, wobegongs are very friendly. You gotta look out for the gray nurses and the tigers. But even they're fair enough dinkum if they're used to you. My mistake was to tangle with a great white. He sounds enormous, was he? Not all that much. They can go to 40 feet. My boy wouldn't have been more than 24, 25. And you actually swam close enough to him to put a marker on his dorsal fin? That's the size of it. I didn't think he'd mind. He was friendly enough until I split away. And then... And then? He turned on me and took my foot away. Why? That's a question I'll be asking him when I finally catch up with him. And taking it out on him in revenge. Well, what could you do to a fish in his own element? Well, first off, your shark is not a fish. He's a mammal, just like you and me. And second, plenty. With my scuba tanks, you and I could meet him in a reasonably confined space. I could gouge his eyes out with my thumbs. Cripple him as he did me. And then I could take my time to destroy him with a knife. And what would that prove? It would be my revenge. For what? When the shark injured you, he was only protecting himself. What would his death accomplish for you? Some justification for the way he lamed me. Or you lamed yourself. What? Oh, come on, Gunner. When you go up against an animal with whom you have no communication, can you blame it for acting on instinct or for the consequences to you? I, I don't know if I understand you. Then let me make it perfectly clear. I don't like to see the best man I've ever met in my life downing himself or turning out to have feet of clay. One foot. Just one. And it isn't even clay. So you lost a foot. That's the end of life. It doesn't give you all that much trouble that I can see. You can still do a man's work. Better than most men. If you were like some, you'd really have something to cry about. Like who, for example? <laughs> like Chris. Who? Who's Chris? My brother. Oh, what's left of him? What happened to him? Skiing accident. He broke his back. He'll never walk again. Or use his arms. He's stuck in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Helpless as a baby. Oh, Eve. But he doesn't go around wanting to blow up the slope he took the spill on. He doesn't want to gouge out the eyes of the beginner he had to dodge on a downhill run who was lying right in his path. I don't know how he has the guts to do it. 
But he's taken what life threw at him, and he still grits his teeth and faces up to make the best of what's left to him. All right, Eve. What's the difference in your life, what I do? I want to save you from yourself. But more than anything in the world, I want you. For once in my life, I want to know what it is to be loved by a real man. Remember, I'm just a hired hand. And you're a married lady whose husband foots the bills. I'm not likely to forget. But I didn't do it for anything I could get out of it. I did it for Chris. It costs a fortune to keep him living. And J.H. Burden is the only man who was able to pay for it. That's why I sold myself. And it was worth it. You're some kind of lady. Oh, God. Gonna hold me, hold me close. Why did we meet six years ago? It's too late to cry over that. At least, can we have tonight? It's not enough. For us, it has to be everything. Or nothing. I give you everything, Eve. He wouldn't let you. How could he stop me? A hundred ways. Nobody goes up against J.H. Burden and wins. I'm not afraid of him. He's as strong as a bull. One foot and all, I could still take him. He wouldn't meet you even up. He'd drown you in lawyers and call in his mafia. You wouldn't stand a chance. I'd like to call him out. There's only one thing stops me. What? The shark. That big white enemy of mine that stirs my bile and makes me less than a man. Until I can cut him out of my mind and my life. Are you asking me to wait for that? It's the only shot at happiness we have, Eve. Suppose I test that. How? Suppose I tell you that you have to make the choice now. Me or your white death. Which would you choose? Maruka! The boss! Ah, uh, yes, Jim. What is it? Bye-bye, pretty soon. Here come Dingo Man by Doc. Dingo Man? Big boss, chartered, ladies, husband... Better maybe you get ready to see him aboard for Dinkum. Jay, back already? So it seems. Maybe just in time to save us both from any more mistakes. One thing is no mistake. I want you to know it, Gunner. How, why, so fast? I don't know. What I do know is this. I love you. What do you ask from me in return? Not a thing. I guess it was just too late for us both before it began. But the obverse side of the coin is that many ends are only beginnings. Aboard the Fair Dinkum, once again, are three people, each of whom in his own way is a time bomb. And a mystical psychic aborigine who has predicted death on this voyage. But whose death? A human being? Or the great white shark who haunts Gunner's dreams. I shall return shortly with Act Three. She rides in deceptive quiet at anchor, this magnificent sportsman's dream of a boat. And all is quiet aboard. The calm before the storm. Only J.H. Burden sleeps noisily but deeply, lulled by his usual quart of spirits. In her bunk beside him, Eve lies with open dead eyes, chained to her servitude. In his bunk forward, Gunner Trent is tortured by deep feelings and emotions he thought he had long ago left behind. And cross-legged on the prow deck, Jimmy, the clever man, the psychic, rocks in a private agony as he tries to part the curtain of the future. Then at long last, the sun is risen, and they are underway toward the barrier reef. You want coffee, boss? Oh, I could use it, Chug. Thanks, mate. Anyone stirring below decks? Not yet, boss. By and by now, we should keep up charter, go back, our place, home. You're still getting bad vibes? What? I mean, the spirit's tell you bad things. One bad thing. What? 
I'm going to return it to you. Tell me what you see, Jimmy. Here is stars. Five places at point. Jimmy, boss, woman, charger man. What's the fifth point? The white dead. So, what do you read in these signs, Jimmy? One died. Only one. Which? It is not said. What happens to the others? The spirits say that depends who die. Not good omen, better we turn back. I don't think we could, even if we wanted to. We're all charted on collision course. Everyone riding his own private route to disaster. We might as well play the game out. Man cannot fight the great spirit. He say who die. No way make change. Okay, whatever you say, Jimmy. Just the same, I still think I can take care of myself with everything. Except... Right. Yes. Too right. That's between the shark and me. If I ever track him down. It was well on into the day before either of our charter friends stirred up. And then it was J.H. Burden, still drunk with a head to match, dragging himself up to the shark tower to sit by me. Australian lover this morning. Didn't you hear me, Aussie? I heard you, J.H. Maybe I just didn't read you. Oh, we're going to play a little uptight. Huh? I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Mr. Burden. I'm going to try to disregard you. Otherwise, I might be tempted to knock your head off. Drunk or sober, I can handle you, cripple. You've got a foul mouth. I'm in a foul temper. What the Sam Hill went on between you and my wife while I was missing? Not one ready thing. More's the pity. You better be right about that, chum, or I'll nail your carcass to your trunk. I don't take too well to threats, J.H. If I ride here, why don't you call me? If we weren't riding some heavy sea right now, I might just do that. Then again, I might just turn around and head back into port. You will shout on me, boy, and I'll sue you for breach of contract till this boat of yours rots wide on the beach. I'll take you to get your marlin, and once you've landed him... Maybe I'll take your measure for once and all. I might just look forward to that. I'm going below to fetch my own gear. When I fish, I want to be sure I can trust everything I handle. It helps sometimes to trust the crew behind you. I don't need you or your boy except the Gaff and Landon. I'll pull them in. Just you find them for me so I can hook them. I was mad enough to chew nails. But I didn't want to have a showdown with J.H. yet. That would wait until after the charter and he paid me. And besides, I did have a bit of a guilty conscience. The way I felt about Eve. After all, she was his wife. I didn't want to think anymore. I wanted action. Jimmy? Yes, sir. Fetch yourself up here. Jimmy, come look at this bit. Oh, look up. I'm staying here now. Is the lift awake? Yes, sir. Him sit by big fish chair. Oh, uh, yes. Good. I want you to fix her and her man some brunch. You can bring me some food up here to the bridge. Then I want you to sit out five lines. Two for stern trolling, both outriggers, and the heavy duty for the chair. Yes, sir. All right, hop to it. Better we not fish. Better we turn back. If I don't get him a marlin, we're out one charter, Jimmy. I want my money. Better be alive, ma'am. And which one? What are you reading now, Jimmy? We keep going. Someone dive us. Who? It is not give to Jim to know where to point the bone. Or just don't point it at me or Eve or yourself. It is not my power. That all around great spirit. Better we go back, boss. I'm sorry, Jimmy. No can do. This time I've got to pit my gut hunch against your superstition. Something tells me to go on and take my chances. Now you go fix some food. running a pretty heavy quartering sea, and I had my hands full for a moment. I did glance down and saw Jimmy talking to Eve, but then my attention was on handling the boat till we fought through the chop. And it was a surprise to realize suddenly that Eve had joined me topside. Good morning, Gunnar. Good morning, Eve. Jimmy tells me we're going to do some fishing this afternoon. That's the plan. Seems like a right idea, since that's what the charter is all about. Jimmy doesn't seem to think so. Jimmy should belt up. He's been filling you full of his superstition. He doesn't have to scare me about this trip. They never should have started. Maybe the old fear of a woman being aboard ship bringing trouble is more than superstition. I look at it differently. I think it's all fate. 
I'm scared of what that could mean, Connor. Why? You don't know Jay. He'll never believe there wasn't anything between us. But there was. That is. That isn't what I'm talking about. And anyway, in the hard light of day, it's something to forget. Perhaps not. Once we feed your pig his big fish. I have to think of Chris. Anytime I want to go back to the market, I can make all the money that's needed for your brother. You'd do that for me. What about the great white shark? A man can trade one dream for another. Maybe the old Kacharadon doesn't loom so large anymore. You'd never be sure. Well, let me decide that. And Jay will never give me up. He'll kill you first, or have you killed. We'll cross those bridges when we come to them. First, I'll let him find his fish. I gave my word on that. The next three days, I left it all to business. We pulled in a grab bag of smaller shark, some marlin we cut off the hook, and one 800-pounder we towed in and landed on the reef. But we were still hunting the big game. And J.H. was getting dicier and dicier about it. After weighing up the 800-pounder, we were walking back toward the dock. You don't want to record him. Hell, that's just bait, old J.H. boy. I'm looking for what you promised me. Something from 12 to 1,500. I, I don't remember promising you that. <laughs> just by being who you are, it's what you led me to expect. But time is winding up, boy. I only got maybe a couple more days. You going to deliver? I don't know how I'd answer that, J.H., except for something Jimmy told me. Oh, what do I care what some old fool has to say? Jimmy is my friend. All right, all right. So what did Jimmy tell you? That this last trip we will catch the big fish. How does he know? He divined it, sensed it. And you believe him? I believe it. But that's not all he divined. What else? With the fish comes death. For whom? He doesn't know. You want to risk it. Dumb superstition by an old man? You gotta be kidding. Come on, Gunner, we got lots to do. First, we catch my fish. Then we settle some scores. We put out to sea again. But it looked as if we were in a run of bad luck. J.H. was drinking again, and just about to throw a willy, when on the second day, we made the strike. It came on the main line out of the chair and it hit like a ton of bricks bucketing off to nowhere at the speed of an express train. Man, oh man, maybe you didn't con me after all, boy. I've hit the big one. Let him run before you take the strain on that line. Don't tell me how to fish. Hard of port, Jimmy. Don't let him foul the stage. He's looping back. Can you handle him? Don't you worry about me. Just don't let him get under the boat and carry away my line. Watch him, Jimmy. I see both. Jimmy, don't let him go. What is it, Gunner? The big marlin. It looks as if... What? Give me a hand, quick. I've got to get into my tanks and scuba gear. What for? Don't ask questions. Just help me. Can you hold him, J.H.? Don't you worry about me, Gunner. Old J.H. ain't letting this big boy get away. What is it, Gunner? Give me that strap. What is it? What I've been waiting for six years to come up against. He's not not the shark. Right there, where it's breaking water. You see that fin and the marker on it. If I had time to put the sonar on it, you'd hear the bleeping. What are you planning to do? Hey, that's no marlin. Some kind of shark. That's right. Not your fish, but mine. What in the Sam Hill you mean, not my fish? I'm out here on charter and I'm paying for it. This is my fish. No one's taking it away from me. That's where you're wrong. What are you doing with that knife? Now I'm suited up, I'm going to cut your line. And then it's just between me and white death there. I'm cutting my line. This is my fish. Hey, don't be a damn fool. For me, you've been squaring for this. Give me that knife. Jay, look out for the line. Oh, I saw my foot. He pulled me into work. Stand out of the way, Eve. Let me cut the line. What are you going to do? I'm going into the water after him. I went down into the water. The end of the cut line in my hand. The tension was suddenly gone. Which meant the shark was circling, striking back at J.H., trapped by the line coiled around his ankle. That's when we came, face to face. The shark, all 24 feet of him, sliding by, the bloody hook fixed firmly in his jaw, my red marker clamped to his fin. The enemy I'd stalked for six years. 
Or was he within my reach to rip out his vitals and exact my revenge? Or did something hold me back? Some feeling of territorial imperative. That these were his waters and I was the invader. That he was wronged and I the wronger. I don't know. I only know that my chance was gone. And it was up to me to decide if this was the end of the hunt or if a new one should begin. I'm sorry, Eve. But he was dead before the shark turned on him. I wish I could say I'm sorry. But it just seems like fate. Jimmy read all the signs right. What about the shark and you? We've closed our bargain. I don't want any more from him. And I hope he's had all he wants of me. I reckon I'm a free soul again. <laughs> Not for a moment. You think you're ever going to get away from me? <laughs> That's the advantage of being caught lame. I'd never be able to run that fast. We shrink in terror from the flashing teeth, the grinding jaws. But the shark has no animus. It doesn't hate us. If we invade his kingdom, we must realize that he doesn't bring the danger. We accept it and bring it upon ourselves. So we take all precautions, of course, and protect ourselves if need be and hope that the nearest any of us have to get to the great white shark is not in his medium, but only through the medium of a tale such as this. I'll be back shortly. It was Francis Bacon, the famous philosopher, who said, Revenge is a kind of wild justice which the more man's nature runs to, the more the law ought to weed it out. Certainly it is a bitter settlement if exacted and twists the man who does. Gunner Trent was fortunate that instead of finding it, he found love instead. He was one of God's fools, which means he was the luckiest of men. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Ian Martin, and Joan Lovejoy. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.